I'd like to ask our panelists to join me on screen for our conversation, understanding the value of LGBTQIA plus businesses. And I'm gonna start with Brian. Uh, I'm gonna ask each of you to give us a self introduction to talk about who you are, who you work with and how you work with the community. So Brian, I'm gonna start with you. Yeah, thank you, Sean. And thank you to everyone um, for, for hosting today's event. I think this is such an important topic and something we all need to be talking about regularly. And the reason why we need to talk about it regularly is, is that there's so much opportunity that we are missing. Um, and so we've got to figure out a way to harness that opportunity and empower all queer people across the country to continue to, to create. But we'll talk about that later. Right now, you asked about who I am. So my name is Brian. I use he and him pronouns mostly. And for about five months now, I've been the CEO of Start Out, which is the national nonprofit dedicated to helping, empowering, and promoting LGBTQ plus entrepreneurs. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the organization for a while, but the reason I joined Start Out is really because my entire career has been built around trying to make a difference. Um, and the idea that I want to leave the world in a better place than I found it, much like so many startup founders and entrepreneurs and small business owners try to do as well, too. Um, and so for me, my background has included a number of different opportunities to do that. Uh, I started off as a high school teacher with Teach for America. Then I spent several years in Washington, D.C., um, on Capitol Hill and in democratic politics. Uh, and then I went and got an MBA because I thought I wanted to figure out the project management skills from the private sector and apply them to the public and nonprofit sectors. Um, I spent a small time at Google um, and then spent six years as the deputy commissioner of the Chicago Department of Public Health and four years as Lambda Legal's regional director for the Midwest office. I'm based in Chicago, where I live with my nine-year-old child, Nico, who's amazing and fun, and the reason I want to continue doing good work to make the world better, which is why I'm so excited to work at Start Out and join y'all here today. Thank you, Brian, and I see you have a lot of free time. So <laughs> with that, we'll move to Irene. Irene, if we can have you share your self-introduction. Hey everyone, I'm Irene Tang. My pronouns are she and they, and I'm based in Houston, Texas. I'm a program director at Start Out. Um, as Brian mentioned, Start Out is a 501c3 nonprofit that supports LGBTQ plus entrepreneurs. I specifically work on research and insights for our community, work on a tool called the Start Out Index to estimate the local, state, and national impact of LGBTQ plus entrepreneurs. And I'm currently writing a report called the State of LGBTQ plus Entrepreneurship. Um, prior to start out, I've been involved with other community nonprofits and also had a corporate career also at Google and at CBS Interactive. Uh, so thank you so much for having me today. Thank you, Irene. And last but not least, Justin, if you could go ahead with your self-introduction. Great. Well, thank you, Sean, for the invitation to participate in today's uh, panel. Obviously excited to do so with Brian and Irene. We're proud to partner with you all at Start Out in, in empowering our LGBTQ plus business community. Uh, I am Justin Nelson, co-founder and president of the National LGBT Chamber of Commerce. I use he, him pronouns. And if we have anyone joining us uh, with a visual impairment, I have short brown hair, a mustache, and a goatee. I'm in a pink, uh, kind of pinkish polo, light pink polo. Uh, I am in a hotel in Mexico City with a, a white background and uh, thrilled to be here. Uh, at NGLCC, we uh, uh, help businesses uh, grow and thrive and expand their companies through uh, primarily supply chain work. So uh, we're 20 years old or 21 years old almost now, uh, and we work with about 450 Fortune 5 multinational corporations to get LGBT-owned firms into the diverse supply chain, so selling their products or services uh, to these companies. We also work on a number of issues with other uh, national business advocacy groups through our National Business Inclusion Consortium, including uh, Women Business Enterprise National Council, the National Minority Supplier Development Council, Women Impacting Public Policy, the U.S. Black Chamber, the U.S. Hispanic Chamber, the U.S. Pan-Asian Chamber, Disability Inn, and our partners at the National, uh, Veteran, Associate, National Veteran Business Owners Association. And we do a lot of things there for intersectionality and identifying ways that we can collaborate to empower businesses with, uh, with cross-segment intersectionality. One thing I also want to mention is we have very specific and intentional 
educational programs that help develop companies both for uh, our communities of color and our trans and gender expansive communities. So thank you for being uh, here to participate with us today. Uh, a little bit about my background. I have been with the chamber for almost 21 years as one of the founders. Prior to that, I was a lobbyist before it became such a dirty word in Washington, uh, working on patient physician advocacy. And prior to that, spent several years uh, as an aide in the United States Senate and United States House. I come from a small business background, split my time between Washington, D.C. and with my partner in Fort Lauderdale. Thank you, Justin. And Justin, we're going to continue with you and share more information about the NGLCC. Can you talk about the growth of LGBTQ plus businesses in the US today and what you've seen happen over the past 10 years with LGBTQ plus businesses? Absolutely. And I think, as I mentioned in the intro, just being here in Mexico City, uh, I'm here for a trade mission and we have 15 LGBTQ uh, businesses that are here to bring their product or service to this region. Um, it's not necessarily unique to today. This is the second time we've been here, but it's almost to the month that we were here 10 years ago. So I think the fact that LGBTQ businesses are looking at expanding their products and services globally in a, in a structured way says a lot about where we are. I think there have been a lot of advancements. I mean, where we are today versus 10 years ago is really a lot different, but it's a lot different depending on where you live. Uh, oftentimes we like to homogenize that the LGBT community or the LGBT business community are one or two things. We're not. It is highly dependent on where we are geographically and quite frankly in what industry that we're in. I think the really beneficial thing is that we have a lot of uh, uh, forward thinking, creative, uh, cutting edge businesses and minds in the LGBT community, which means we are starting to develop businesses that are very relevant to today's uh, and what tomorrow is going to look like. Um, I think the other thing that's important about the growth over the last 10 years I mentioned the 450 companies that we work with, you know, 10 years ago, it was a fraction of that, maybe 40 to 50 companies that were looking to add LGBTQ businesses to their diverse supply chain. So who they're buying from, uh, similar to buying uh, products and services from ethnic minorities or women, those were the two organizations or the two uh, segments that had uh, had been in the supply chain previous to NGLCC. Now, since then, we've helped start certification programs for both the disability community and the veterans community. And it's really exciting to see the number of certified suppliers. You're going to hear from Jules and Stacy in the next uh, segment uh, that are now growing their enterprises and connecting with companies through our organization, our certification and others. And then the kinds of businesses that start out as helping to really be the next generation of businesses that we can help scale. So I think net net, it's a very positive uh, growth trajectory that we've seen. We have literally seen billions with a B of dollars spent with LGBT owned companies over the last 10 years. Uh, is it on par with other diverse segments? Not yet. Is it growing? Absolutely. And then again, we can't uh, discount uh, political factors that are happening in different parts of the country that truly do impact uh, LGBTQ businesses' ability to grow and scale. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about access to capital and some of the other uh, challenges that we see, you know, regardless of geography, but I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. And you kind of hit on my next question, which is, what kind of impact economically the community has for the overall economy. And part of that, you're in Mexico now. Who are you there with? Because I want to talk about or learn about a little more who you're with and what impact that's having internationally. Sure. Uh, well, we're here uh, with the International Trade Administration, ITA, part, part of the Department of Commerce and working with uh, the uh, U.S. Commercial and Foreign Commercial Service. Uh, these, by the way, are U.S. taxpayer funded advocates to help U.S. businesses, LGBTQ and other businesses export into markets around the world. 
and you know, I just was giving some remarks at last night's uh, opening reception that it's the best kept secret in the world or one of the best. And that's not necessarily a good thing. These are genuinely, we're all taxpayers. I often say as a red blooded tax paying American, we should have the same rights and responsibilities and opportunities to participate in taxpayer funded uh, uh, programs. This is one of them. And it's amazing. And I, I just have to say that the Biden administration has been the most inclusive administration uh, in history. And certainly within the world of uh, trade and uh, uh, exporting. And that's really something that's exciting. So we're here as a part of that program. We're looking at other ways that we can team with uh, ITA and commerce and commercial services to do more of these. We just had a, one of our affiliates from my Miami Dade that did a trade mission down to uh, uh, Columbia, and we're already planning trade missions for next year. So that's exciting. In terms of economic impact, a lot of you on the call may or may not know uh, if you've been around the queer community for a number of years, you've heard his statistics. Bob Wittick and Wittick Communications, uh, probably one of the foremost authorities on, on uh, LGBTQ statistics and impact, uh, estimated that the economic uh, impact of our buying power now sits at about $1.8 trillion. So as consumers, we, we're spending about $1.8 trillion. If you are someone that has a product or a service that is marketed to uh, customers, that's something you can't uh, pass up. On the business side of things, there had never been an economic impact study done. And our, our data is a little bit dated. We are going to be doing an update next year. It's 2017 data, but uh, I think it's important. We didn't want to do this update during COVID because there was a huge drop off in revenue for almost every small business across the country. So we didn't want to see this you know, giant gaps in, in graph. But in 2017, when we released this data, by the way, Bob Wittick, uh, we'd commissioned Bob to do this study. The first First time that there had ever been a look at what LGBT owned businesses put into the economy. And I want to give the caveat that there's a difference between what our economic output is and what our challenges with accessing capital are. They're not diametrically opposed, but they're not able to be equally equated. So one doesn't necessarily mean the other. There are huge gaps uh, in access to capital still. However, with that being said, and that caveat being mentioned, that study found that the estimated 1.4 million LGBT owned businesses in the United States have a combined economic impact of around $1.7 trillion. And what, how I like to sort of uh, couch that is if you think about it in terms of a map, it would make the LGBTQ business community the 10th largest economy in the world the 10th largest economy. Now I'm in Mexico right now, right? And I believe it's around the 15th largest economy in the world. So uh, who is not going to wanna to do business with the 10th largest economy in the world? And I, I sometimes joke about it, if that were the case and we were our own country, you know, our, our national anthem would be if I could turn back time by share. And I think, you know, we'd probably have a national cocktail, which would be uh, vodka soda maybe, and our national bird would be the peacock because we kind of like to strut around. But the reality is there is a huge economic impact. And when we have detractors and policymakers that sort of think all we do is be gay all day, which I am gay all day, by the way, but we also employ people and pay taxes and really are a part of this small business engine that makes the economy run. So that's something we should be proud about and we should claim it and we should make sure that it's at the forefront of our uh, continued fight for equality and inclusion. Thank you. I think that's amazing, the contributions that you're bringing awareness to from our community. And part of that contribution, I'm going to move over to Brian now with this, is Start Out. Start Out is an organization that helps people who are innovators, inventors, entrepreneurs move into that segment of commercialization that really Justin is working with. So. Tell us about Start Out and what challenges you see are being faced by the community before they even get to this phase and how you guys are working with inventors and entrepreneurs to move into that market. Yeah, thank you for those questions. And, and, and Justin, thank you for, for all of that information and such too. I, I feel like when you were talking about um, who our small business owners are and, and that we're the cutting 
edge minds in the community, I think was the word you used and talked about the diversity in the community. That's something we see every day specifically to, to the entrepreneurs um, in the community. And that, that's who Start Out really serves. So we, we're a 501c3 national nonprofit organization that supports and powers um, LGBTQ plus entrepreneurs through programs, resources, information, and data. Irene will talk about some of the data and the insights that, that they've gleaned from, from their work in that area. But really what we boil down to is, is the reality that it is hard to start a business in this country. It is especially hard to start a business if you are LGBTQ plus in this community. Um, I don't want to give away too much of the data, uh, but I will, I will take a couple of numbers um, that Irene has helped us find out. Um, over the last 20 years, $2.1 trillion, that's trillion with a T, have been invested in high growth startups, um, which is where one of the areas where startups particularly focuses in. Of that $2.1 trillion, only 0.5% has gone to openly LGBTQ plus founders, even though we know that we are at least 8% of the population. And so there is a real disparity there. Um, Irene will probably boil down some more specifics about those numbers and how it's even more challenging than just what I presented and how we're actually a better return on investment than our straight cis counterparts, but it's a real challenge. So Startup provides mentorship programs. We provide access to capital through our investor portal. We provide um, an accelerator lab that helps high growth potential entrepreneurs get the five month curriculum necessary to help take their, their idea to reality. Um, but one of the key things that we provide also is community, because as any entrepreneur will tell you, being an entrepreneur is lonely. And it's especially lonely, lonely where you're an LGBTQ plus entrepreneur. Um, and so we provide events around the country, um, socials, education, virtual um, summits and conversations so we can connect with one another and share our experiences and share the challenges that, that are unique to queer people trying to start companies. Well, I say unique to queer people, but truly it's, it's marginalized people across the board in this country who face some similar systemic barriers. And I think um, without going into the numbers, I, I think I'll, I'll share an anecdote that was probably my second week on the job. I was in Los Angeles. It was my very first public event. Um, we had about 100 or so community members, founders and investors from LA come out and I was getting to meet them. There was a, a masculine black lesbian next to me and she was talking to one of our team members and she's a founder and brilliant. And she said that she was thinking about her next hire and she was wondering if she needed to hire a white guy to go do pitches for her when she's looking for investors. That is a horrible question that any founder has to ask. And we live in a society where she's asking that, even though she is brilliant, she has the idea, she has the ability to make the pitch, but there are systemic barriers making it harder for her than it would be for someone who frankly looks like me. Um, and so Start Out's goal is to help entrepreneurs like her get connected to investors and also change the system so investors will welcome her into those rooms and listen and make decisions based on the merit of her idea and not who she is. Um, because we know that LGBTQ entrepreneurs are too often um, facing the, that question of who they are versus what they're bringing to the table. And so our goal is to create a society and a place in an entrepreneurship ecosystem where everyone is welcome and everyone has that equal opportunity to grow and thrive. We've been able to do that and we've shown some real success stories and have some incredible founders who, who've turned things around and created brand new ideas and taken that cutting edge mind that Justin talked about and made our society a better place. Um, but we've still got a lot more to do. I, I agree entirely when Justin says that that we're not there. We, we made tremendous progress over the last 10 years. Um, Start out started about 15 years ago. And so we've seen that progress too, but we're not on par to where we need to be. Um, and we're not on part of where we will be. Absolutely. And so, Irene, I'm going to turn it over to you because this is a combination conversation with Start Out, what you offer and what you're tracking. And you created an economic index on contributions of the LGBTQ plus community. Can you talk about your findings from that index and talk about what factors are impacting states in either negative or positive ways that you want people to take away from this data? 
Yeah, I can give a little bit of context about our Startout Index in the first place. Um, as Brian mentioned, we gather data from a variety of sources, including our own internal databases, Crunchbase and PitchBook, in our analysis of over 142,000 founders and 95,000 companies across the United States that raised at least 250,000 in funding between the years 2000 and 2022. That's when we discovered, you know, LGBT people are not raising as much of a percentage of the funding that we've studied as compared to all entrepreneurs. Really, it doesn't really match up that we're such a big part of the population, but we're only getting a very small of percentage of VC funding. And this is something that happens with a lot of other minority groups too. So people who are LGBT and Latina or people who are LGBT and Black, they may be facing even greater challenges because we see the same stats being reported with the Black community and the Hispanic community as well and reports by other nonprofits focused on that area. Um, but we did also discover on average LGBTQ founders were creating higher percentages of jobs, filing for more patents, having more exits, um, despite raising less funding compared to the average founder, about 16% less funding compared to the average founder. Um, and there's a lot to, to, to potentially explain. Like we also looked at regional differences. So of the funding raised by LGBTQ founders, Almost all of the funding was raised in only top five metros, with San Francisco raising six times more than New York or LA. And that's not the same thing that we see with all founders in general. So when we looked at LGBTQ founders specifically, we found that like within the San Francisco Bay Area, 58% of the funding was that was raised by LGBTQ founders was raised there. But when we look, looked at all founders, even though San Francisco is such a big hub, only 36% of funding for all founders was going to San Francisco. And so we're also trying to understand what are ways that we can maybe help change these differences. We looked at regions that have a lot of L, um, a lot of founders in general, but no LGBT founders. And that's when we found a lot of these major cities in the South didn't have founders who were successful at raising funding or creating jobs and filing patents. And those were all based in places in states that had very bad policies for LGBT people. So like Orlando, Charlotte, Birmingham, they all have huge populations, but we're, we were not able to identify any entrepreneurs who are able to raise that minimum threshold that we were studying. Um, and so all these, these stats that I'm referring to, you can find on our website, startup.org org slash index. Um, and then I guess I can also add a little bit more about policy recommendations. Then we studied the, rec we basically studied the differences that these effects of these public policies had on entrepreneurial outcomes by using some statistical modeling, a difference in differences model by comparing states that did and didn't pass the same policy between 2010 and 2020. So based on these historical estimated impacts, we do actually have some recommendations for policymakers, and these are also on our site as well. But in my home state of Texas, if we implemented things like state employee benefits for transition related care or guidance and treatment of inclusion of trans students, like we'd see a lot more jobs that could have been created in Texas because of these policies. And we don't, we didn't really study necessarily the reason for why that's the case. But I mean, I have my own theories or hypotheses on why this might be the case. Like LGBT entrepreneurs would not want to live in a place that has so many barriers for them to just live. And the same thing as a founder, you may want to be more interested in founding in some of these other regions because it's hard to find the full talent pool if people maybe don't want to live in that area or if you want people to come to the office, they might not want to be living in states where like they could be concerned that their children may be taken away from them or that child protective services is you can't allow your children to have transition related care. So I think, you know, these founders also want to live in a place safe. They have LGBT family members and generally they're I think there's just a lot of reasons why people might not want to, but you can kind of check out some of these recommendations that we've outlined on our website. And um, there's an interesting report this year from Wells Fargo called like the secret sauce. And basically it said places that have higher LGBT representation also have higher, greater economic prosperity, even when they isolated like a whole bunch of variables as well. So, I mean, that's kind of the same thing we see reflected in our research as, as well. And that's, great insight to everything that occurs around just 
not only the economic impact of a business, but their reasons for wanting to be where they are nationwide. Um, this information, Irene, is it available for free on the website? Anybody mm -hmm. can access, right? Yeah, so if you just go on startup.org slash index, like people can break down by their own region. So we have it sorted by different metro areas. So you can kind of click through the policies. Like you can see the estimated impact of how many jobs are created in your specific area by LGBT entrepreneurs or by, by state or even at a national level. Awesome. Well, with that, I want to bring it back to a final question because this went by so fast with so much information. But what is, in your quick 30 second sound bites each, and I'll start with you, Justin, what is the one thing you want people to take away from this conversation to remember about the economic impact and value of the LGBTQ entrepreneur? In 30 seconds, all right, we're gonna go for this. <laughs> um, I think that the reality is, is it's more important now than ever that we really lean into these statistics and the true impact that we're making in communities, both you know, our state, local, and national economies. Uh, you know, the people that are with us are with us. We need to get to 50 plus 1%, and we need to be able to have those conversations on things that matter to everyone. Bread and butter issues, tax, you know, we're helping build schools, pave roads, and build bridges. And I think those are really important things, and we should never, ever shy away of the economic impact that we're making. If you want to learn more about NGLCC, www.nglcc.org. Thank you for this and what you all are doing at USPTO and to my friends that start out always great to uh, have a conversation with you and we look forward to continuing our partnership. All right, Brian, you're up next. Thanks. Um, ditto to everything Justin just said. And I think um, when I think of, of the work that we have to do and the idea of equality for all people, um, it's important that we win hearts and minds of people across this country. Um, unfortunately, we've seen a backlash against LGBTQ plus people and LGBTQ plus children, especially over the last few years. Um, and it be, it's become evident that, that sometimes it's hard to win hearts and minds, but we're going to keep trying. But in the meantime, the conversation we're having today um, is a reminder that if you make all the decisions based on your wallet, then you should also support equality and equity because LGBTQ plus people, entrepreneurs and small business owners alike, have great ideas, launch phenomenal businesses, and make more money doing it. Um, the return on investment, as Irene talked about, is higher for LGBTQ plus founders than it is for, for nearly anyone else in the ecosystem. And so it's important for us to talk about that and recognize that and let people know that if we are going to build a stronger economy across the system, we need to support LGBTQ plus people. And we need to support LGBTQ plus people because it's the right thing to do. Um, and equality for all and diversity for all will lift all votes. And Irene, that leaves you to close us out. Yeah, I think the biggest takeaway is even though starting a business is really challenging or even just putting yourself out there is really challenging based on where you may live geographically for, for many reasons, there are a lot of resources out there. Like Justin mentioned, there's like local NGLCC chapters, um, Startup has local chapters. There's a lot of people out there who do want to support you and do want to uplift you. So being able to surround yourself in that kind of community can be very helpful for your mental health and also to get mentorship or get advice. Um, and Startup has a bunch of free events throughout the year, both online and in person, that can help you regardless of the stage of your business. So even if it's something as simple as coming out, if you're uh, able to and comfortable or just being a good ally for it, someone who's LGBTQ in your life, I think that's great too. Awesome. Well, thank you all. I have learned so much from this panel that I was not aware of about the economic impact and the contribution. So thank you for all your work in making sure that we continue to progress and advance in this area.